Hi everyone, welcome to the third devlog for Infiniwar, the stylized, modern military, real-time tactics RPG that I've been working on for the past two years. As always, what you're seeing is work in progress of the current state of the game. Previous devlogs covered prototypes I made before beginning work on the full game, but today I'm going to be showing you the very first steps that I took when I started actual development, beginning with the terrain. At the end of the video, I'll share four key techniques that I learned to help accelerate my learning through tutorials. So I had already decided to replace the boring, flat, featureless plane that served as the terrain in the artillery game prototype. But replace it with what? I could start handcrafting levels, but I'm a solo indie developer. If I want to have enough levels, I'd have to reduce their quality or accept a quality reduction somewhere else in my game like art or systems. Editor Joe here. Speaking of quality reduction, you might notice some unfortunate artifacts in this video. I got a new camera and I'm still figuring out all the settings. There's a few places where the automatic white balance looks less than ideal, but unfortunately I didn't catch it in time. Rather than re-record everything, I'll just make sure it's fixed in future videos. Anyway, back to the devlog. I also have a full-time job, and now the beginnings of a YouTube channel, so I can only dedicate a few hours a week to game dev. Not to mention, I don't have much level design experience, so I'd be starting out even slower. Even if I did pour lots of time and effort into multiple levels, they're still finite. Players can play through levels much faster than a solo designer can build them, spending dozens or hundreds of hours only for a player to consume it in a few hours or maybe even a few minutes just didn't seem worth it in my case. Also, I'm building this game for myself and I thought there was a good chance I might be my game's only player. If I'd already spent hundreds of hours building a level, I might be bored of it before I even got to play through it once. So what's a lone indie dev to do? The answer is procedural generation. Build a system of rules that can generate an endless number of levels with infinite variety. Lots of my favorite games growing up used procedural generation, and I think it was a big part of the reason that I found them so engaging. SimCity 2000 had a map editor I spent hours in, reticulating all the splines until I found something I liked. Reticulating splines. Reticulating splines. Reticulating splines. Each city you started was unique because of the unique map it was built on, even if the game mechanics were the same after that. Age of Empires and Civilization II had randomized map scripts that gave you a new world to explore, exploit, and conquer. There was just something special about venturing into the unknown in a map to discover its riches that was just very compelling. And of course, Diablo 1 and 2 were all about exploring a procedural dungeon with a changing layout. The sanctity of this place has been fouled. Ah, fresh meat. The loot and even the monsters can be thought of as procedural too and that is definitely something we are going to be returning to. Okay, so I like procedural generation in my games. There's just one problem. I didn't know how to do it. I also knew there were some downsides to procedural generation. No Man's Sky, for example, at least how it initially launched, and Starfield more recently, have both been criticized for poor procedural environments. Randomness that doesn't change anything about gameplay is kind of pointless and complete randomness is just incoherent and uninteresting. So in addition to learning how to do it at all, I need to figure out how to do it right. We're gonna stick with the basics today though, that part we'll deal with in a future video. So how do I start learning about procedural generation? Well, there's tutorials for that of course, but I was a little worried about using them. I spent a long time climbing out of tutorial hell in my first devlog. Uh, the link to that is somewhere on the screen and in the video description. I didn't want to just blindly copy someone else's code, but at the same time, I didn't really have a clue where to start. What if I didn't understand it? What if the game started feeling like it was someone else's again? Maybe I'm just not cut out for this. If I can't even take the first steps on my own, I'm clearly not a real game developer. Just some imposter. Around this time, I ran across a devlog by Thin Matrix for Equilinox, his low-poly ecology simulator 
and one of the first things he covered was procedural terrain. The terrain was simple, but it looked nice and stylistic. I could almost imagine my little artillery soldiers running up and down the hills, dodging explosions. Thin Matrix does devlogs, not tutorials, but his work still gave me a glimmer of hope and inspiration. He was doing this all on his own with his own engine. Surely, if I have an entire game engine at my disposal, I might be able to pull off something like this. There was only one way to find out, but I still needed a tutorial. In the end, all aspiring newbie game dev roads lead to Rome. And by Rome, I mean Brachys. If you don't already know, he's a ubiquitous and well-known creator of game dev tutorials, especially for Unity. So he has not only one, but several tutorials on terrain generation. So I followed Brachys' tutorial, and I tried not to copy his code directly. Instead, typing it out myself, and trying to understand what each line did, at least a little bit. Mesh generation is a little obtuse. There's odd rules about micromanaging triangle and vertex indices, confusing conventions about winding order, and hidden pitfalls like backface culling, and so on. The tutorial does a pretty good job of making you aware of these things, although it doesn't explain them exhaustively. By the way, some of this mesh generation voodoo will end up being useful later on when I attempt procedural buildings. We'll talk about that another time, though. Generating a flat mesh of triangles is nice and all, but we wanted to get away from flat ground. The secret sauce is Perlin Noise. That's just a fancy name for smooth noise that changes gradually rather than completely random static. Sampling some Perlin Noise and adding it to the Y coordinate of every vertex in the mesh is all you need to get some smooth height variation. Pretty neat. So in the end, I completed the tutorial. I had Bracky's terrain. But it wasn't mine. Yet. I thought back to Mark Brown's advice from the first devlog. Don't just do the tutorial. Start experimenting. I didn't fully understand the code, but I at least understood parts of it. Enough to start tinkering. So I messed with the parameters and changed the noise to get different effects, applied a material to change the color. Simple stuff. But just turning the knobs Brackies gave me wasn't going to be enough. I needed to see if I could extend the tutorial to really make it my own. As it was, the terrain was just a visible mesh with no interactivity at all. You could drop a ball or a block straight through it and nothing would happen. That got me thinking. How hard would it be to get physics working for the terrain? I knew about colliders from my past projects, like the artillery game. Maybe a mesh collider is what I need? To my surprise, it worked. I mean, after some Googling and fiddling with settings, it worked. I had balls rolling around on my terrain. Cool. My terrain? I thought it was Bracky's terrain. You know, the more I modified it and played with it, the more it felt like mine and not his. Physics objects rolling around is all well and good, but the soldiers in the artillery game don't work that way, and I didn't really want to use physics to move my units around, uh, too unpredictable for a strategy game. I knew I'd want to have them navigating around obstacles and things, and for that I'd need pathfinding. That sounded hard, maybe doable, but taking a long detour to write a complex system that could take weeks or months to see any results sounded like a great way to kill my momentum. I want to build a game here after all, right? Fortunately, Unity has a nav mesh package and Brackies has a tutorial for it. Uh, it wasn't a continuation of his last tutorial though. It was a brand new project with static level geometry. This turned out to be a good thing though, as it forced me to improvise and adapt the tutorial to my own needs. Seeing how he set things up initially was helpful, but I couldn't just copy what he was doing exactly, so it forced me to learn both the nav mesh package and the terrain generation a little better. A win-win. With the nav mesh in place, I could steer the ball around, purely driven by the nav mesh, with no physics involved. A simple raycast, similar to the artillery game, would call the navigation AI and tell it where to go. Cool. I have to admit, this package ended up being a lifesaver. It's going to end up being really important to the game. I was a little worried that I wasn't building something so fundamental to gameplay myself. But as I thought about it, I could say the same thing about the rendering engine or the physics engine, all of Unity. Sometimes you just have to accept that you're building on top of what others had done. As one of you commented, standing on the shoulders of giants. So the terrain was looking a little more interesting, but the units were still 
sad. I wanted to see if I could level up my 3D art skills. I thought it might not be a good idea to try something complicated like an animated soldier right away. I could probably use someone else's, but I really wanted to keep the art mine where possible, and figuring that out sounded like another long, momentum-killing, motivation-sapping detour. What about something with simpler shapes and animations, like a tank? I thought back to a trailer that I saw for Tiny Combat Arena, and I thought, maybe, just maybe, I could do it. This was an exciting idea to me. With the terrain generation and nav mesh working, I could almost imagine what a tank would look like rolling around on the hills. In fact, it got me thinking again about my old favorite world in conflict. Of course, that game is realistic looking, has a ton of game mechanics, not to mention it was built by a whole studio full of artists and developers. Reaching for something like that just felt like a pie-in-the-sky pipe dream. But at the same time, I needed to see how it would look. I had already dabbled a little bit with ProBuilder, a Unity package for building simple 3D models directly in the editor. It's primarily designed for quick prototyping and gray boxing of levels, so it's not a full-featured 3D editor like Blender or Maya. But at this point in my journey, that was an asset, not a liability. Previously, I had tried to stumble my way through Blender a few times, but I found it overwhelming and confusing. It was really easy to accidentally activate the wrong mode without realizing it and just have everything go haywire. It's a real complex beast. Slaying the Blender Dragon is gonna have to wait for another day. Unity has a tutorial for building a simple house with ProBuilder, but I wanted to model a tank. Again, this turned out to be a good thing, as I couldn't just copy the tutorial directly. Instead, I had to learn the tools and the principles, and then think about how I would apply them to what I wanted to do, and then make an attempt myself. I didn't really know what I was doing at this point, but I knew enough to be dangerous. And fortunately, the shape of a basic low-poly tank isn't much more complicated than a few oddly shaped boxes and cylinders with a few modifications. It's not much, but it'll do for now. Okay, okay, I haven't changed it at all in two years. I promise at some point it'll get a facelift. At first, I didn't worry about getting anything animated or functional. Just getting it pointed in the right direction and moving was all I was going for. The moment I saw the tanks rolling around on the hills, I know I must have had the biggest, stupidest smile on my face. I stopped development and played with it for probably 10 minutes straight, even though there wasn't much to do yet. I had made a simple but recognizable facsimile of something that I thought was totally out of my reach. Okay, you need to squint a little bit, but it's there. More importantly, I had cracked the code of accelerating my learning with tutorials. One, avoid copying. Two, tinker and experiment. Three, extend or mash up multiple tutorials. Number four, find a tutorial that teaches you the fundamentals rather than the exact thing you want to do, and then adapt it and improvise to meet your needs. It's a good thing that I figured this out when I did, too. That Blender Dragon isn't going to slay itself. I'm going to need all the help I can get. In the next devlog, I'll be standing on another giant's shoulders and learning the fundamentals of 3D modeling.